Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to present the speaker for this afternoon's ceremony, Mr Jeff McQueen, Honorary Fellow of the Faculty of Informatics and Founder and Managing Director of Internetrix. Mr McQueen enrolled in a telecommunications engineering degree at the University of Wollongong in 1997. As a student, he applied his computer and web development experience to freelance work for a range of small clients. This freelancing proved so successful that in March 2000, Mr McQueen founded his IT company, Internetrix. Internetrix has now become one of the Illawarra's leading technology companies, with clients around the world and a partnership with Google. In 2007, Internetrix was named the Illawarra Business Chamber's Business of the Year. In late 2008, on the strength of Internetrix's newly formed applications division, Mr McQueen started a new company, Hive Systems, which has itself become an award-winning business. In 2009, Mr McQueen joined the board of the new community-owned Wollongong Hawks and also became a foundation board member of Regional Development Australia Illawarra, the peak regional development body in the Illawarra. He is also a foundation board member of the Illawarra ICT cluster and an active participant in Silicon Beach, a forum for Australian technology entrepreneurs. In 2009, Mr McQueen graduated from the University of Wollongong with a Masters of Business Administration and in 2010 received an honorary fellowship from the University's Faculty of Informatics. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr Jeff McQueen. Good afternoon, everybody. Graduates, today is a day that you will remember for the rest of your life. This might be because you feel proud, you feel a sense of achievement, a culmination in thousands and thousands of hours of work and study. It might be because, quite frankly, you feel relieved. No more cramming for exams or assignments or staying up all night to try and meet a deadline. For the coders, you might feel dominant. You finally beat the compiler and debugger enough to actually graduate. And on reflection, you might feel appreciative for the help and support of your teachers, your family, and your friends. And hearing some of the cheers in the back, I think some of them are more appreciative of finishing than others. Probably for all these reasons, and more, this is a special day for you. So when I got a call from the VC asking if I'd like to give the address at today's event, I wanted to make it good. So as you do, you jump on Google and you do some searches for what amazing speakers have done before you. You read speeches from people like Steve Jobs, Nelson Mandela, and Theodore Roosevelt. And then you start getting scared. I think, God, I'm going to have to impart some pretty amazing wisdom and advice. After all, this is such a special day. See, there's a problem. You see, I'm only about 10 years older than most of you. I don't have enough grey hair for wisdom. But worse, I'm a fraud. So I never graduated from my degree in informatics. I'm a dropout. So what legitimacy do I have to share with you as graduates, people who made it further than I did in informatics, what to do now that you're graduating? So rather than try in vain to fill you with wisdom I don't have, with a lack of legitimacy. I thought instead I'd share with you a few stories and issue a challenge to each and every one of you. Because here's the truth. If you only take away one thing from today, I want you to remember this. It isn't where you've been or what you've done or what you've got. It's what you do next that counts. So I'm going to share a few thoughts, a few lessons that I've learned in the hope that they can help you to rise into the challenge of what you do from here to do amazing things. As mentioned, I'm a dropout. In early 2000, I was uh, about to start my fourth year of teleengineering. Um, and frankly, the whole world in technology was going crazy. So the internet promised to change everything. We weren't going to need shops. We weren't going to need all these different things. It was all going to happen overnight. And everyone was going crazy. I'd been working for a couple of years as a freelance web developer, um, something that you know, helped pay the bills a little bit better than slinging drinks at the Novotel. Um, and I decided that 
at that time, with all the excitement, uni was just moving too slow for me. So in the space of about 10 weeks, I moved out of home, dropped out of uni, quit my only income earning job at the Novotel, and went into business full time, founding Internetrix. I registered Internetrix on the 10th of April 2000. Within a week, less than one week, the Nasdaq crashed and the dot-com bubble burst. The industry I'd just thrown myself into had just been taken out the back of the shed and shot. So how was I able to grow Internetrix from a one-man band into an award-winning company, recognised as a partner by companies like Google? How do we manage to land clients in the US, Japan, China, New Zealand and of course here in Australia, ranging from small businesses through to public companies and even as high as the Prime Minister's office? Well, there were three things. Working hard, being passionate and never standing still. If you can imagine, it's 2000 and I'm a 20-year-old kid with uh, really no track record and not much experience going out trying to convince small businesses in what was now turning into a downturn that they should give me a couple of grand of their money to build a website. Now that's a pretty hard sell, but in Wollongong it's an even tougher sell. Then three months into starting up they introduced the GST. I couldn't afford an accountant so I had to learn tax law myself. And then when you're young and inexperienced you're easy, easy prey for bad actors. People who rip you off and then when you decide to fight back threaten to sue you. Learning commercial law on the run and how to survive in the jungle required a lot of hard work and hard lessons too. But in the face of this hard work, I wasn't even remotely tempted by the alternative of taking up a graduate role. There's a couple of reasons. It could have been because I wasn't actually a graduate. <laughs> it's kind of a big issue. Um, it could have been because the industry that I was involved in had just exploded and there were no jobs anyway. But the real reason was I'd been bitten by the startup bug. The freedom and challenge to create something out of nothing was too intoxicating for any corporate or government role to ever satisfy. See, I was passionate about what I did. I believe that the internet sorry, presented a tremendous opportunity for businesses, but they needed to look at it seriously and with a hard eye to getting a return on their investment. But because we took this approach from the very beginning, I was able to build a business on pretty solid foundations. The other key lesson that came from this experience was the need to have a hunger to keep learning. Things in our industry change so incredibly fast. You need to be constantly reading, experimenting, learning and tinkering. So what are the lessons from the experience of dropping out of uni, starting a company in the middle of a nuclear winter as we called it in the industry and then fighting through to the other side? Since what matters is what you do from here, my advice to you from this experience is to make sure you do something that you're really prepared to work hard at, that you want to pursue with a passion and that you want to keep getting better at every single day. My second story fast forwards a little while to January 2006. I was sitting in the Hard Rock Casino in Las Vegas. I was a guest of the new owners of MySpace, which at the time was something like the fourth or fifth largest website in the world by traffic. Later in that same week, I was back in Silicon Valley, pitching to the world's most respected VC or venture capital firms, names like Greylock, Kleiner Perkins and Sequoia, the companies that made Google, Yahoo and Facebook what they are today because of their initial investments. I spent three months in early 2006 living in Silicon Valley at the home of a guy you might have heard of called Mike Arrington, the founder and editor of TechCrunch. And all of this happened because I co-founded a company called OmniDrive with a fellow uni dropout who actually went through with it at the same time and who left about the same time as me, Nick Kabrilovic, in mid-2005. Now, if any of you have used the product Dropbox, you'll be familiar with what we were trying to do with OmniDrive. We were building a cloud-based um, product that could synchronise your files in a very clever way. But while we failed, and Dropbox is now valued over a billion dollars, so we really did fail, this crazy roller coaster ride was one of the most valuable things I have ever done. Thrust into the limelight of Silicon Valley and playing the startup game with the best in the world was an amazing experience, not for what I learned about business, fundraising or technology, but for what I learned about myself. See, if you haven't been there before, when you're driving down Highway 101 through the heart of Silicon Valley, 
you pass a lot of buildings. Most of them are pretty ugly and pretty boring, but some of them have logos on them you would recognise. These are the headquarters of places like Oracle, Google and Yahoo. Seeing these famed companies, these institutions of technology, as buildings, not brands, places with real, real, I guess, staff and real people working there, was frankly paradigm shifting. See, Silicon Valley is unquestionably the top level on the world stage of technology. The companies there define technology for the rest of the world. On one lucky occasion, I got to have dinner with Mark Andreessen, the founder of Netscape, because he happened to get an intro to Nick and myself from a friend. It was, it's that kind of place. Initially, as you can imagine, for a boy from Wollongong, I felt pretty damn inadequate and out of my depth. But it didn't take too many meetings with VCs, conversations with entrepreneurs at dinners, or chats with top engineers from some of these venerable companies over a beer or two to realise that, frankly, I had what it took to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in this place. See, I'm nothing special. I was an average student. My staff would ban me from hacking and coding today if they could. And yet, as time went by, I got the sense that I wasn't out of my depth at all in this place. And then I thought back to all the people that I'd studied with, all the people that I'd worked with, all the people I'd competed with here in Australia, and I realised that all of them had what it took to hold their own as well in this global heart of technology. We were world class. The distance from Wollongong to San Francisco might be thousands of miles, but when it comes to the calibre of technologist, the gap isn't that big at all. The University of Wollongong has one of the best IT programs, if not the best, in Australia. I know, because I generally hire UAW graduates and that really helps. But what I'm saying to all of you sitting there today is that you have what it takes to go toe to toe with the best in the world as well. Sure, you need to work hard, be passionate and never stop learning, but you have what it takes. And to further illustrate my point, two friends of mine, fellow UAW alumni, are sitting in Silicon Valley right now just ahead of you. They're only a couple of years out of graduating themselves. One of them was sitting there unemployed on North Beach in January this year. And now he and his co-founder are in discussions with Google, PayPal and others to acquire their startup, quite probably within the next week. That's January this year. And I tell you this story to really highlight and give some credibility to the fact that these guys are just like you. If they can do it, you can do it. Why shouldn't you be the next Jobs, Page or Zuckerberg? So what are the lessons here? Remember, since what matters is not what you've got but what you do with it, my advice is to have a mindset that you are world class, to do something world class and to do it on the world stage. My last story isn't my own. So obviously it's going to be a much better one. Theodore Roosevelt, 42nd President of the United States, was elected to office in 1901, aged just 42, the youngest president the US had seen. Still regarded as one of the best presidents ever. Shortly after he retired from office, he gave a speech at the Sorbonne in Paris, one of the world's oldest universities, whose history stretches back to the 12th century. His speech was both a warning and a challenge. He reflected on the temptation of the learned and privileged scholars and academics before him to become commentators, critics and cynics. Then he issued his challenge with some of the most stirring words I have ever read. He said, it is not the critic who counts, nor the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errors, who comes up short again and again, because there is no effort without error or shortcoming, but who actually strives to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself on a worthy cause who at best knows in the end he will triumph in high achievement, and who knows at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, 
so that his place shall never be lost, shall never be with those cold and, cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. There is little use for the being whose tepid soul knows nothing of great and generous emotion, of the high pride, the stern belief, the lofty enthusiasm of men who quell the storm and ride the thunder. Well for these men if they succeed, well also, though not so well, if they fail, given only that they have nobly ventured and they have put forth all of their heart and their strength. When it comes to rising to the challenge of what we're all gonna do with our education, our skills and our lives, I believe this message is the most important. As Roosevelt says later in that same speech, to you and your kind, much has been given, and from you, much should be expected. As informatics graduates, you have more power, more opportunity to change the world than any other group in the history of mankind. There are now more than a billion people online around the world. And if you throw in mobile phones into the mix, there are billions more. We've seen how technology has changed the world in places like Egypt and Tunisia and other parts of the Middle East over the last few months. Closer to home, we can see the opportunities that technology provides to change healthcare, education, how we live, how we work. And these opportunities are so vast especially when you consider we're only three or four decades into an information revolution. But to make a change, to make a difference, you have to be in the arena. This might mean doing a startup. It's never been cheaper or easier to create something from nothing. Cloud services, app stores, and the open source movement give you the tools, platforms, and distribution to create something that I could have only dreamed of 10 years ago. It might mean creating the change you seek in your workplace or in your community or in your soccer club or even in your government. Whatever the temptation though, the key is to avoid the temptation to just throw rocks, criticism and cynicism from the stands. Show the courage and get down into the arena. From here you'll follow many different paths across careers, across industries and certainly across the world. Take a moment to reflect with pride in what you've achieved. Enjoy this moment and remember, it isn't what you've got or how you got there, it's what you do with it from now. Good luck.